My name's Ed Mantler. I'm with the Mental Health Commission of Canada, and I'm thrilled to be one of your co-chairs for this morning's session with my um, colleague. I'm Aoife from Headstrong, the National Centre for Youth Mental Health in Ireland. Um, so first, we're going to have a conversation about advocating for and achieving real reform and investment in youth mental health. So first, we have Mona Mohammed, who is currently one of three youth advisors to the Ontario Centre for Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health. So as an advisor, she provides a consulting and supporting role for both internal and external process of youth, of, uh, youth participation in that organisation. Next, we have Helen Coughlin, who's a social worker in Ireland with the Royal College of Surgeons, and she's um, worked in the international youth mental health uh, field for over 10 years and she was lead writer in the declaration on youth mental health that was launched in uh, 2013. Next we have Patrick McGarry who is executive director of Origin Youth Mental Health Research and professor of youth mental health at the Centre um, for Youth mental health at the University of Melbourne. He is also a founding board member of Headspace and a world leading researcher. <laughs> do, we, do we stay here? Yeah, we just stay here. <laughs> Good morning. Great. Um, so I'm really excited to be here with Helen and Pat this morning. Um, we're going to be talking about a topic that's pretty hefty. I've kind of broken it down into questions that I'm hoping that they can address uh, within the short amount of time that we have. So um, I'll get started. Uh, so we're talking about advocacy um, to achieve real world reform in mental health and investment in mental health. So just first off, what does real-world reform look like to you based off of your personal experience? Uh, it's, it's a really interesting question because I think the question of, like, when you look at reform, it's a really simple concept around change is happening, right. things are, are shifting and changing. But for me, real-world reform, certainly in the area of youth mental health, is that we move beyond innovation. So there's, there's tremendous kind of appetite for change. There's a lot of innovative things happening. There are great conversations. But I think until it becomes sort of a norm that we that we are not this smaller collective of people having these conversations about something being new and that new becomes the norm so that that everybody is kind of remembering back to a time when we sat at a conference in Montreal and talked about things being different and then for me that will be real reform. I feel like stigma reduction plays a huge piece in that because I think if it's more normalized to talk about mental illness then that real wor world reform happens where it's not just these small conversations that we're having, but on a bigger platform. Pat? Mm. Yeah, well, I guess um, what you hear all the time from the public and from people who try to use mental health services or get help for um, in periods of mental ill health is that um, what's being offered at the moment is not right. Um, it, it doesn't feel right. Um, I, that's certainly what I felt when I first started training in, in, in the mental health field, that it was in, it was in fact in the old 19th century sort of models of the asylums, and that was clearly was about 100 years out of date. But what's, been, what's, it, what's replaced it is still not right, and, and uh, everyone says that. You hear terms like the system's broken and this kind of stuff, but try to get reform actually happening. It's incredibly entrenched what is, what is there, the status quo. It's underfunded. It's, it's dysfunctional and it's not the fault of the people working in it. It's just the, the, the design of the system and the level of the scale of it is wrong. So it, it doesn't function in, in the way that it's meant to, even though the values of the people working in it are, pr are pretty good, generally speaking, I think. But to change it is incredibly difficult. And once it does start to change, there's resistance to that change, you know, and it gets undermined. So this reform process has to, has to be understood in a political way and, and, and socio-cultural way as well. And we have to get a lot more professional about, about this process, I think, to understand the, the machine of it, you know. And um, that's, that's, that's what we've been trying to learn, I suppose, over the last um, 10 or 15 years, especially. And mental health 
is something that's extremely complex, but I think everyone, if not a lot of people in this room, approach it with such a passion and uh, such a belief that this is the right thing to do. And a lot of times in advocacy to actually see change, sometimes those values have to be compromised. And whether you decide to compromise them or not is kind of up to you. But to fit within these systems and to ensure that you get funding and that whole process sometimes mean, means compromising that. How do you, get, wh what's your take on that? So um, do you feel like there is a need to compromise your core values sometimes to ensure that you, there is kind of development or movement towards the goal that you're achieving? Helen? Um, here's the thing, for me, if you're going to advocate, you don't compromise your values. That's the core and the essence for me. And I think what maybe what you're talking about is the sense that when you do that and when you hold on to your integrity and your values, that, as Pat said, there's huge resistance to that. Um, and, and there are questions you need to ask of yourself to say, you know, am I willing to continue to hold this position? Um, you know, against the odds at times, you know, with, with the resistance or the negativity or the misunderstanding or that sense of threat that people might feel. Um, but for me, it's always been about saying, you know, you, I only advocate because I'm doing what I think is right according to my values. Um, so it, it would be impossible for me to think that I might, I might take different action. I might think about how I do it differently. What do you mean by that? So that if, if I'm going to hold on to my values and I'm going to continue to advocate, I need to be savvy and smart in how I do it so that I minimize sort of the, the resistance or, or the potential to fail and maximize the potential to gain. So I, I have to think about how I deliver the message. You know, one of my learnings has been how do you do that in a way that doesn't frustrate other people, um, that they're willing to hear and able to come with you? How do you surround yourself with people who are going to come with you um, and support you? People like, in, in, for me, Pat has been a massive support for me, who's been able to say to me, keep going at times where it's been difficult. And I think I think that's probably the challenge is always when you're at trying to advocate or, or kind of agitate for change is that you will always meet fields of and people who are as I said, threatened or in opposition to what you stand for. And it's a tough place to be. Right. So, but overall, you feel that if you're compromising your core values, it's kind of taking away from the integrity of your advocacy in general. Absolutely. So, so you still advocate, but, but as I said, the, the, the question is, in what way do you do that? And can you do it in a way that is really going to, to, to ensure that you retain your values, but also get maximum gain from your efforts? Right. Great. Pat? Well, like Helen said yesterday when we were preparing the session, uh, we're the wrong people to ask that question, in a way. But but um, ha having said that, um, and I think what Tony said yesterday, Tony Bates was interesting. That when times get tough and, and you're really on the back foot, you know, um, the vision it, it, it's easy to lose the vision. And, and I think that, that was a really good comment. You know, the vision and the, and the values. But you know, on the other on the other hand, politics is the art of the possible. You know, and um, you know, there's a, a, a famous Australian Prime Minister called Gough Whitlam who said, there's none so impotent as the pure. You know? So th there is an issue here. You, you, you've got to get stuff done. You know, um, if, you, if you're too, uh, ex uh, I suppose, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, isolated on the moral high ground too much, you know, then you're not going to get anything done. So, but, but um, on the other hand, again, um, mental health has been bought off so cheap in the past, you know, people have just accepted absolute crap from, from, from government. Mm -hmm. um, um, just complete ticking the box, um, window dressing, shifting deck chairs. Sorry, even in Australia right now, there's a mental health commission which is, was a fantastic group of people, produced, you know, a pretty good report, but the constraint on it was you can't have any more money, you've just got to make things more efficient with what you've got, when we all know that it's probably about 50% of what is really needed to provide the same quality of service as people get for cancer or heart disease or anything else. So that's completely unacceptable. That sort of, co that kind of compromise is, is, is not acceptable. And, but the only way we can overcome that is by persuasion, coming back to Helen's point, you've got to be uncompromising in one way, but you've got to be able to bring people with you somehow and, um, and give them confidence that, um, you know, uh, not just the values, but you've got some practical solutions for things. And this is what we, are, w this conference is fantastic for because everyone's here on equal footing helping to, to work that out. Mm -hmm. Great. I'd like to kind of talk about 
I think that it's important <laughs> to carry transparency when we're talking about advocacy because we're all facing the same struggle as advocates for, for mental health. So I kind of would like to talk about challenges and barriers. I know that from a youth perspective, we're constantly talking about personal experience for a lot of us, but something that's really hits home and that advocacy can sometimes be reliving that, that personal experience, which is, which is really challenging. So in my opinion or from my from my personal viewpoint, um, I carry the advocacy of um, kind of understanding the different, dif how different cultures understand stigma and the way that my culture has understood stigma and how that's affected my, my care. So carrying that advocacy with me, the way that I've kind of overcome, overcome the barrier of having to relive that and the pain that that's caused me is by ensuring that I self-care, and I learned the hard way, but ensuring that I make sure to self-care while I'm doing my advocacy. So from your perspectives, what would you consider is a barrier in your advocacy, and how have you overcome it? You can pull from a personal example, if you'd like. Again, I think that the, the barriers for me have been those internal struggles about how I do it. Um, at, at times, I think that, that it always, because you, I, I am someone who doesn't like conflict, so positioning yourself in, in, a, in a place where you are going to potentially annoy people and piss them off and do all of those things is, is tricky. Um, so I think there's, there's a greater good and trying to hold on to that idea of greater good without, without kind of harming myself along the way, I think the self-care. But I think there are other bigger barriers without a doubt when you're advocating. I mean, the barriers are, are that, as, as Pat said, in my experience all along the way is, is is that sense that, that people look to what you say and agree and they nod and they smile and they say that's wonderful, but they always see it as external to themselves. Men, and I'm preaching the converted, so I'm not referring to those of us here in the room, but, but many people that we've come across and that we've tried to do work with will smile and nod and say that's wonderful and, and go and do it you. And so the barriers about, about being able to bridge the gap between people who in principle say they support, but actually, are terrified or resistant or too conservative or their egos are too fragile or whatever it is to be able to accept that possibly they need to be part of that change process. I think it's about striking that commitment. So we work in youth engagement, which I know that both of you have um, have experience in as well. And there's there's a lot of that. There's a lot of the, yeah, we, we get it, but not seeing organizational change in that means that really there hasn't been that culture shift or that common understanding or a commitment to reducing that barrier to getting youth engaged. So yeah, that definitely resonates with me. Pat? Yeah, well, uh, I guess there's no shortage of barriers. Um, <laughs> but and, and I guess Hel Helen was talking about internal barriers. I was just thinking about that. Um, um, what what holds you back or what um, I suppose the style of, of it the style of, of the way you go about it we've, we've just been talking about that um, but on the upside if you don't have enemies in, in a reform process then you're not actually doing anything you know if, if there isn't resistance then you're not you're not you're not changing anything and the, the biggest enemy is the status quo because inertia is just incredibly hard to shift um, and we've seen it a couple of times in, in mental health, I suppose. W probably the most dramatic example was deinstitutionalization. Uh, that was the biggest change, and, and uh, that was so totally non-evidence-based, but it was, it was something like, it was probably driven by a moral principle, really, in a way. Um, um, it's a complex phenomenon, but um, that, once that got ahead of steam up, it, ha it just happened no matter what anyone wanted you know, or, or said, and, and um, so that, I suppose um, you know you can get to a tipping point, and, and the question is, uh, how close are we to the tipping point? And we feel like we're making a lot of progress with early intervention and youth mental health, and it's definitely had an, I an influence. But it still seems to be stuck in some ways. You know, there's still uh, we're probably we're still in the foothills. I think someone used that term. We're in the foothills in one of the one of the talks, and I, that's I, th I think we still are. I don't think we've got to the tipping point, and why is that? Well. You know, um, you know, we ha we had a, a thing in Australia this week called Mental As, which the National Broadcaster has done last year and this year, which is a whole week of programming on the National Broadcaster every single day on radio and TV for a whole week, and the funds raised go to go to mental health research. Now it's been an amazing awareness raising thing, so we've got a great awareness, 
but we have had no action or investment in mental health care in that last 12 months. And this year, the funds raised for mental health research were less than last year. So there's something about the public's mindset, which there's some resistance and barrier there too, despite you know being able to reach them all. You know, um, we and that we're reaching them with the socially acceptable forms of mental ill health, like depression, anxiety. There's very little publicity to the more you know socially unacceptable forms, like anorexia or psychosis or borderline. You know which are obviously very serious problems, which we don't, we're hiding them still. So I think we've got a fair way to go with it. And so there's, so the barriers are probably in all of us, in, in all of us still, we've all probably got some kind of attitude problem about mental ill health. Yeah, and I think that kind of resonates me with me in that I find that a barrier is a lot of times we can't be patient in the work that we're doing and we need to be. Uh, you guys spoke to the, the social change or moving past the status quo and that takes time and people and, and it's hard to see that um, there might not be as much change as quickly as we'd like to. So I, I feel like that's a huge internal barrier as well. Um, so for our last question, I just wanted to ask there are a lot of advocates in the room once again, and is there one piece of advice that you'd, you'd give to them moving forward in their advocacy? I don't know about advice, because I'm not sure if I'm the best person to give anybody advice, but I think, um, here's the thing, when I, when I, when I was approached, I'm, I'm standing in obviously for Sarah Brennan, who's the CEO um, of Young Minds, and uh, I'm not a CEO of any organization, um, but, he, but I started off as a clinician, and, and when I was a clinician, I advocated. Um, and when I moved out and became an educator, I advocated through my role in education uh, and training of social workers. And when I worked with Headstrong, I, I advocated with an NGO whose mission and vision was to change the landscape for youth mental health in Ireland. And then I left there, and now I'm in, in, in research at the moment. Um, and I continue to play a role and play a part. And I think it's about accepting that you don't have to be the person on the news or the, or, or the public face, that, that advocacy can happen absolutely everywhere you position yourself if you're willing to put the greater good and the needs of others and to use whatever voice or role or position that you have to try and, and, and make some impact, some tiny, if it's even tiny or major, um, change in the position that you hold. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just holding on to that and, and and acknowledging for yourself that you, you are doing things, you are an advocate possibly without holding the title or the, the kind of mantle of being an advocate. Pat? Well, I think um, almost everyone here, that, uh, certainly everyone that I've met, um, has got the passion, you know, and, and the energy and the and those common values about what we're, and it's a very altruistic sort of source of energy, isn't it, that you feel because, you know, you feel for people and, and, and um, and, and, and probably m most of us here have had some mental health issues at some point. So it's driven by something very strong. But coming back to what we were talking about before, that's not enough to change things. I don't think that's enough. You know, um, even, even like I was saying about the mental as thing, the public uh, you know, connect with it for that reason as well. But it's not enough to, to actually generate change. So there are some missing bits. And this is where the political smarts must, must come in. We've got to learn how to work the system much more effectively. And we have, we've had some successes in Australia and Ireland in that way, we have lear have learned a bit, you know. Mm -hmm. And in the UK, uh, Max Birchwood, and um, there are some lessons to be learned. And, and I think the one we haven't tapped into is self-interest, because people vote on, on self-interest, the, the old hip, poc hip pocket nerve, you know, that they talk about in elections. And one of the issues of self-interest is, you know, if you, if, if you don't, don't have health care available, and this is a big health care issue for which, you know, quality care is not available, even in rich countries. So we've got to turn it into a, a voting issue. I don't even think the economics of it, which are quite powerful as well as an argument, uh, are, are enough to, to, to influence politicians. The economics are a lay down mazair, really. But um, we've got to do more research to, to, to demonstrate and nail it, I suppose. But it's really the politics of it. Once it becomes a voting issue, which politicians will, you know, uh, be threatened by. I mean, there are obviously some some champions in politics too, that, but not many, I'd say. Um, so I think that's the other thing. Advocacy has got to be a lot more sophisticated and smarter, not just beating the, the heart, you know. That's where you get your power from. But 
you can't just mindlessly go about it. It's got to be much more sophisticated, you know, in, in this day and age. I just want to thank you. I think I'm good. I want to thank you, Helen and Pat, for, for uh, sharing those insights with us. That's been fantastic. And isn't Muna a good interviewer? I'm impressed. <laughs>